Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Ethics for Lunch for May. Uh, I'm Mark Hughes. I co-chair the Ethics Committee with Cinda Rushton. And uh, as many of you are aware, this is a, a monthly session that we have for the uh, hospital community, sponsored by both the Ethics Committee and the Berman Institute of Bioethics. Um, I want to remind you that if you uh, want to get CME credit for uh, attending this session, uh, you can text that number, the 443-541-5052, uh, with the code 29864, and that will um, uh, give you credit for it. Today, we're going to be talking about the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, and especially with regard to access by personal representatives uh, of a patient uh, to the medical record. Uh, we have a distinguished panel. Uh, Going to have in each of them introduce themselves, and we'll start with Margaret Brennan. Hi, I'm Margaret Brennan. I have practiced cardiology at Hopkins for years, but I'm here today as the patient co-chair of the Cancer Center Patient and Family Advisory Council. Howard Levy. Good afternoon, I'm Howard Levy. I'm a internist and geneticist at Johns Hopkins. I'm also a, an EPIC physician champion. I co-chair the patient family center design team, which oversees my chart. I am the physician lead for our uh, adherence and compliance with the 21st Century Cures Act information blocking rule. And I am also a cancer patient, so I am both a deliverer and consumer of medical information. I'm Lorraine. I'm Lorraine. I'm an attorney in the legal department with Johns Hopkins. I focus my practice on HIPAA and privacy matters. And so information blocking and, and 21st century contact. Um, I was the, the legal advisor for Hopkins' implementation of this. And Becky Seltzer. I am Becky Seltzer. I'm on faculty in the Division of General Pediatrics and at the Berman Institute in the School of Public Health, but I'm here today as my perspective as a general pediatrician in primary care. I work at the Harriet Lane Clinic, um, and I'm excited to talk about some of the issues we faced with this, the Cures Act, and caring for adolescent patients. Great, so I'll uh, just sort of set the stage for everyone. Uh, Suzanne, if you could advance the slides. And just to remind people, if uh, you do have questions along the way, you can put them either in the Q&A or in the chat, and then we will uh, try to get them toward the end of the, uh, the session. So these are the uh, objectives that we want to try to achieve today. Um, talk about the concerns uh, that may exist uh, when patients and or their personal representatives get access to clinical information. Um, there's going to be this tension of the legal and the ethical, uh, where uh, now legally, by federal mandate uh, with the 21st Century Cures Act, we have to have uh, access uh, to information by, by patients. Uh, and if they you know, have a personal representative, um, uh, that person might also get access to information. Some of that information may be distressing to patients, uh, especially if they're learning it um, on their own without the uh, ready accessibility of uh, a clinician to interpret it for them. So we'll talk about uh, how to handle that. We'll also be talking about um, sensitive information that might be in the medical record that maybe the patient has disclosed to the clinician somewhere along the way. Uh, and then now a personal representative um, might have access to that and uh, what are our duties in terms of uh, protecting that sensitive information. Uh, there may be information that uh, is relevant to the family member, you know, if they are the person representative and now have access to information, uh, how exactly uh, are they going to handle that information if it really pertains to them, not just the patient who they might be making decisions for, but, but for they themselves. And then lastly, uh, there are lots of issues in pediatrics, especially in adolescent medicine, uh, where uh, we want to protect sensitive information that the adolescent may be sharing with the clinician, um, but at the same time, there may be a parent that thinks it's important for them to, to know that information. And what are the boundaries uh, in terms of protecting that information? Go to the next slide. So I just want to point out that the medical record has uh, various uses. Uh, so this is our uh, interdisciplinary clinical practice manual and our policy on the medical record. So. Uh, as this says, it's a means of communication among healthcare professionals 
uh, who are providing care to a patient. Uh, so it really is uh, helping to plan and coordinate that individual's care. Uh, it's supposed to document each care episode. Uh, and that way, if you know, you're seeing a person over time, uh, you'll know what happened in the past. Um, there are other, uh, other obvious uses um, uh, in terms of billing and so on. Uh, but really, it's this idea of sharing information either between clinicians and now between the clinician and the patient or an authorized decision maker. Next slide. So this is now in the era of open notes. Uh, so the 21st Century Cures Act uh, just took effect uh, recently. Um, it had been passed uh, a few years ago, but, but now is um, uh, the law of the land where uh, we need to make uh, certain information and the medical record uh, accessible to patients. Uh, really, the intent of Open Notes uh, for the past you know, decade, they've been um, advocating for this, that it, this transparent communication in healthcare is a means of empowering patients to really make them in charge of their healthcare. Uh, so really patient-centered and uh, giving them the information allows them to be a um, more uh, useful consumer of healthcare. Next slide. So the intent really is, you know, to respect persons and respect autonomy, you know, give them the ability to make decisions, give them enough information so that they can make sound decisions. Uh, respect for persons also is about uh, protecting privacy. You know, so people have a, a personal sphere uh, and uh, confidentiality, even though we've got HIPAA, uh, you know, federal regulations that have been around for a couple of decades, confidentiality is a, a longstanding concept in, in clinical medicine. Uh, where we want to protect confidential information, information that's been shared with the clinician uh, that the patient expects some uh, expectation of, um, of privacy. And then a third concept that we need to consider, and especially with regard to whether information can be harmful, uh, perhaps is a relic of uh, the age of paternalism, but the idea that the, the physician in this case or the clinician has the right to omit information to protect the patient's well-being. They're, they're concerned that uh, uh, it's going to be so damaging or so emotionally harmful uh, that they take the therapeutic privilege of not sharing that information. Nowadays, that's been you know, sort of modified to say, well, uh, how do we disclose information in a way that minimizes harm and maximizes benefit? So there still may be a need to share information, but it, it's um, a conversation with the patient about uh, how to do that in a thoughtful way. Next slide. And then the, the, the concept I want to come back to is this idea of confidentiality. As I said, you know, it's been around for millennia. Uh, so the Hippocratic Oath says, whatever I see or hear in the lives of my patients, whether in connection with my professional practice or not, which ought not to be spoken of outside, I will keep secret as considering all such things to be private. So we have that uh, clinician-patient uh, expectation of, of privacy and confidentiality. Um, we're sharing information then with them now through the medical record. Um, but when it now is a third party, uh, a personal representative of the patient, um, what is the expectation there for confidentiality? So we're going to walk through four scenarios. Uh, Suzanne, next slide. Uh, these are the four, and I'm going to start with number one. Um, so what about uh, results that need interpretation? Uh, and I'm thinking in particular about, uh, for instance, in oncology, uh, we may get a, a scan result or a test result that gets immediately uh, released to the medical record. It's then uh, available uh, to the patient or, uh, or to a personal representative. Um, and there hasn't been time for the clinician to actually see that result. It's been released directly uh, to the patient. Um, how do we handle that? So I wanted to turn to Margaret from the uh, Cancer Center PFAC uh, and get your impressions about uh, how to handle that situation. Thank you. Um, seeing bad news alone without a clinician to guide interpretation is difficult. And immediate release of lab results helps that happen. And last fall, um, Dr. Levy generously came to our oncology PFAC and um, we discussed this at length. In the era prior to the Cures Act, a clinician would see the result before the patient. They could comment and advise about any abnormal result. 
And now a patient can see the result before a clinician. Does that cause unnecessary patient suffering or harm? And how is the patient's choice not to see results before the clinician protected? Those were our questions that evening. Who are we? Oncology patients have a high prevalence of comorbid psychiatric conditions, anxiety, depression, and adjustment disorder. And interestingly, one of the criteria to diagnose adjustment disorder, significant distress that exceeds what would be expected given the nature of the stressor. That's this. <laughs> and why is it important? Because coexisting psychiatric conditions are associated with less good outcomes, less good quality of life, less survival, less adherence to treatment plans. So is there a way to, to soften the risk of the anxiety caused by seeing results in the absence of a clinician? Illness brings vulnerability and physicians make a commitment to the, their patients to help them cope with all aspects of the illness. And many patients rely on that. In this reference that's often quoted, discussing bad news in the outpatient oncology clinic. It's from 2006, long before the Cures Act. Presenting upsetting news should be done in a way that minimizes distress. And the most interesting line in this paper is a patient's interpretation of bad news. How bad is this? Emerges from the interaction they have with the clinician about the news. So in the absence of an interaction, that can be more difficult. Now, it's not that the Cures Act has ignored this, when you get an email now, you have new results in my chart. There's a disclaimer, you may be seeing this before anybody else. It is, past, it is possible to blow past that. And if you go to my chart to pay a bill or check on an appointment time, you see new lab results with red exclamation points, even if it's a point above normal. If the patient and physician are together, when a test is ordered, it can be ordered in such a way that the results are not released immediately. But they need the physician and the clinician and patient need to have that conversation. The clinician needs to order it that way. The result will never get released unless the physician manually releases it. And I know that that's one of the many things Dr. Levy and his team are heroically working to operationalize. I will tell you that I personally cannot stand to look at lab results by myself. And my oncologist got to the point where he knew that. He would call me on the phone even with normal results because he knew I would never look. Once you've had a lot of bad news, and my news lately has all been great, once you've had a lot of bad news, your tolerance for looking at it by yourself goes way down. So we just have to be mindful. Is that a preventable suffering we can minimize? Thanks. Howard, your name was invoked a couple of times. Uh, any thoughts about- uh, praise. <laughs> how to handle that? I've gotten lots of thoughts on this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And, and I'll start with, with my, um, my own interpretation of some of the principles of ethics with full disclosure that I am not a card carrying ethicist, but uh, I've been involved in ethics projects for decades in my career. And, and the three principles that I wanna focus on are beneficence, non-maleficence and autonomy. To me, beneficence basically translates to try to do good and non-maleficence is try not to do bad. And I would expand on what was in some of Mark's introductory slides with the thought that it's not always just the patient for whom we need to apply these ethical principles. We need to think about everybody 
to whom it, uh, who may be affected by it. In this case, it's mostly the patient, but, but as we get into our other cases, we're gonna get beyond just the patient. And then autonomy, very complicated, but essentially respecting people's preferences. What do you as the patient or the patient representative want? And here's where I'll now get to what I've read for years and what I now know to be true as a cancer patient myself. I know that some people do better having their crisis in the comfort of their own home, getting over their crisis, thinking through their questions, and then having a productive conversation with their doctor. And that was my experience. When I first learned that I had cancer, I figured it out because I'm a faculty member and my provider is a faculty member, and I got a page that this specialist wanted to talk to me. And, and I knew that I had a test ending, so you don't have to be brilliant to add one and one and get two. And I went and looked at my own result, and I saw it was bad news, and I had my crisis, and I got over it as relatively quickly, called my provider 15 minutes later, and had a really good conversation, many of the details of which I still remember years later. Fast forward to the Saturday after my surgery, when my provider called me at home, and I innocently thought, wow, what a great provider calling to check on me post-op on a Saturday morning. That's fantastic. Well, yes, he was doing that, but he was also calling to tell me that the news was worse than we expected, and I was gonna need to think about additional treatment for the cancer. And I was completely unprepared for that. And that was a crisis that I wasn't prepared to have. And I remember very, very little of that phone call. And most importantly, what's clear to me is that we're all unique. Some of us need to get our information privately or prefer it, sort it out, come to grips with it, and then have a conversation. I'm in that bucket. Others like Margaret, not so much, would rather hear it from the provider. We need to find a way to respect that and respect autonomy and understand what our patients want and find a way to do what they want. The other point I'll make here is that while the anxiety of learning bad news at home can be severe, trust me, I know it. What I'm also amazed to discover is even when I know in my heart that my routine screening test to see if my cancer is still in remission is almost certainly gonna come back normal, in the days between having the sample collected and seeing the results, I start feeling anxious, even though I know it's almost certainly going to be fine. So when we're thinking about what is good, never mind just autonomy, what is good? Is good holding back the data so that someone doesn't see something scary at home? Or is good releasing the data as soon as possible so that the anxiety of waiting for that screening test result is ameliorated as fast as possible? with the recognition that while most of the time that screening test comes back reassuring, some of the times it comes back upsetting. I don't have an answer, but I think we need to continue working to get better at asking what does the patient want? Currently, Epic allows the ordering provider to determine at the time of ordering whether or not the result is released immediately. What Epic has not yet let us do is put more of that control into the patient's or consumer's hand to decide even after it was ordered whether you even want to see it listed in my chart with that red exclamation point, or if you want my chart to hide it from you until your provider has already had that discussion. I think that's something we need to push Epic for the ability to, to give into our consumer's hands in my chart. Pamela, do you have any thoughts about this? I think it's just uh, to, to both Howard and Margaret's point, I think the, the issue is really that the, the law does try to respect the patient's wishes. It's really a patient, you, you, you articulated it very well, Mark, at the beginning, which is this was to put the patient in the driver's seat. And I think the challenge is that we have historically not had the types of discussions that I think Margaret was referring to, which is making sure that when you're ordering these kinds of tests, that the discussion with the clinician and the patient really take place about what are the patient preferences when it comes to seeing test results. And I think some of this law is gonna push provider-patient relationships in a different direction. And I think that's probably a good thing. There'll be more communication about what the tests, what tests are being ordered, what the results could look like and making sure that patient preferences are honored when those results come in. So I think ultimately there's gonna be some hiccups as we implement this law along the road, but I think when we land in a good place, if, you know, a few months down the line, I think once the, the technology catches up, once our training catches up, I think it's ultimately going to be a really beneficial thing for patients to, to Howard's point, patients will then be able to choose, am I the kind of person who needs it immediately so I can you know, take a deep breath 
or am I the kind of person who really needs to wait until my provider has had a chance to review and call? And me as the patient will be able to make that decision. Let me let me throw a little twist in, in this, this situation though. Uh, what if it's now a personal representative? So um, maybe Pamela, you could explain who can get access to the record besides the patient. Uh, and then what are the implications of that person getting information? So who, who are the types of people that could uh, get information? Sure. So currently, um, and, and we have different standards for my chart versus sort of other standards, but I'll focus on my chart because we're really talking about the immediacy of the information. So with respect to my chart, anybody who is considered a legal representative under state law um, would have the right to request what we call proxy access to my chart. Um, and those are typically, I mean, the most common is your parent of a minor child, um, anybody who has guardianship over a patient, and, and anybody who's been appointed as the healthcare agent for a patient. But in addition to those legal representatives, there's also the category of whomever the patient wishes to grant access to. And we have that a lot. So you might have an elderly parent who wants their son or daughter to have proxy access to their MyChart account so they can help manage their health and their affairs. Um, in that case, the, the, the patient actually grants access to, to that individual by choice. Um, but I think, Mark, where you're going, I think that the implications of that are really big, which is I'm not sure our patients have been fully educated on what granting access to a proxy means um, and, and how that is now going to be reflected given the changes for 21st century cures. You know, historically, it just meant, well, you're going to get information eventually on me and I'm comfortable with you having that information because it's the same information I have and we can all manage our affairs together. What you might have is Margaret's situation where now both parties, the proxy and the patient, get access to a test result immediately. The patient chooses not to click the link because they do not want the results. They want to wait until their clinician calls them with the result. But the proxy, the spouse, the son, the daughter, whomever it might be, clicks on the link because they want to know immediately. Now your personal representative knows your test results, but you don't. And how do you deal with that dynamic? And there's sort of something inappropriate about that. But the technology doesn't necessarily um, accommodate for those kinds of issues. So I do think that's where you are presented with your big ethical dilemma of how do you deal with a personal rep who, who may know something before the patient even knows it. And, and we've certainly had examples of more, more family uh, decision-making where maybe the, the patient, you know, prior to the Cures Act, the patient uh, has said, you know, talk to my family member, my son, daughter, spouse, uh, uh, and, you know, they take over the decision making and information gathering. Um, but now you're talking about a situation where we, there's some expectation that the patient wants to receive the information, but now the personal representative is getting it. Um, so Margaret, I, I, I'm guessing in oncology, it's not uncommon that there might be another person that is accompanying the patient uh, to visits another set of years um, and you know that the patient may want them to get access to information. Um, what would you do with the, the situation Pamela is describing of a personal representative has access, the patient doesn't want to know it, uh, how would you handle that or how would the clinician handle that? It, it, at our last meeting in anticipation of today, I asked the group some questions and we are the patient and family advisory council. And it was interesting how many of, of the caregiver family people said that they considered that an additional burden in many cases to be the person that would have to hear abnormal information before the patient. So I'm not sure that that's answering your question, but I, I wouldn't have thought of it that way. And as Howard was saying, this is a bimodal population. You know, some daughters want to know what's going on, but several people that evening said they can, it would be an additional burden on their ability to care for the person if they know something the patient doesn't know and they don't want to share it because they're not really sure what it means. Can I ask a question, Dr. Brennan? Are there um, parents of pediatric patients on your family advisory council? Or adults, but there's a wonderful pediatric PFAC. Because I'm, you know, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about, you know, in teenagers where they have their own access and then parents have separate proxy access, you know, what would that experience be like for a 
teenager who is going through cancer treatments and a result comes to the teen's proxy access and they don't have the ability for that potentially bad news to be buffered by the, you know, sitting down with their parents and receiving that at the same time, because our teens, you know, they're savvy with their phones and they may, something may pop up and they may just open it up. Um, it's not what I'm here to talk about today and I hadn't thought about it, but as you're talking, I'm realizing that could be really problematic and traumatizing for a child. It gets back to the, the, the harm, the do no harm uh, issue that Howard was raising is, um, uh, is it causing more burden or harm to the to the surrogate, to the representative to have this information uh, and what to do with it or how to interpret it, uh, especially if, you know, the clinician's not immediately available to, you know, you can't call them and say, what does this mean, um, you know, for my loved one. Um, let's, let's make another shift in it. What if it's information that might be directly relevant to that personal representative? Uh, so uh, we're thinking about genetic scenarios, um, something like uh, prolonged QT syndrome, a, a cardiac condition uh, that um, is diagnosed in the patient. Um, and for whatever reason, they say, well, I don't want to share this with my loved one. I don't want to burden them. I don't want to make them worry too much about it, um, even though it might have genetic implications for them. Um, but now that personal representative get, gets access uh, to the information, the genetic test result. Um, Howard, any thoughts as a geneticist uh, about uh, how to handle that, that kind of scenario? I'll answer it with at least two hats, my geneticist hat and my knowledge of, of the way my chart works. We do, I think, a poor job in general as clinicians and as, as clinical staff of alerting our patients to the risks in addition to the benefits of appointing a proxy in my chart. For the most part, we tell people, look, if you want someone to have your information, we'll make it as easy as we can. Here's how to establish proxy access. In fact, we would much rather you have your significant other or your child or your parent get their own my chart account as the proxy than having you share your username and password and log in as that person. We much prefer the proxy relationship. So we encourage it. And I know I, when I'm encouraging my patients, I don't actually counsel them on the risks of what if there's something that you don't want your proxy to see. This is another thing that we've asked Epic for as an enhancement. And in fact, there are other organizations making the same request to empower the patient in my chart to selectively allow some but not all information to be viewed by the proxies. That does not exist today. So this is an open question that, that is not yet answered. How do you deal with it? Don't know. Uh, the other point I'll add to it to further complicate the matter is that the inherent complexities of genetics make it really complicated to respect autonomy and beneficence and non-maleficence. Because if I, and in fact, I do know in my personal story, I know of a relative through my father who has a heritable genetic condition, and that relative specific mutation is known. So I could go get tested and find out if I inherited that same genetic change or not. But my father has chosen not to get evaluated. So if I go do that test and I learn my status and I know that that person is related to me through my father, I have now removed my father's right to not know unless I manage to conceal my test result. Because if I've got the same mutation that my paternal relative had, then my father must have it as well. He may or may not ever manifest the condition, but we're now getting to a world where privacy and autonomy are no longer solely in the control of one person. All the different relatives have the ability to, to some extent, interrogate someone else's genome. And, and bring me back to cancer, if you're a bone marrow transplant recipient, yeah. We can anonymize your donor, but you can now have your DNA sequence and you're sequencing your donor's DNA. So the world is full of wonderful ethical questions in the realm of genetics that go well beyond the information blocking. I any, 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 any thoughts about uh, the idea of the genetic <laughs> test that the patient gets that uh, then has implications? So Howard's example of the paternal uncle has the 
heritable disease. Um, his brother doesn't get tested. Howard gets tested as the son. Um, that has implications for the father. Um, does the law speak to anything like that? Well, it's interesting. Um, so medical providers can use other people's medical information to treat a patient. And we see this a lot in this context where you might have a, a mother who died of a certain condition and the physician wants to look at the mother's record to treat the daughter who has the exact same condition because there might be some information they can glean from the mother's record. But that's in the treatment context. I think what this is really about is sort of the patient, again, going back to the patient and saying, does you know what rights does the patient have and the personal reps have? I think in that context, the, the answer, legal answer, I shouldn't say the ethical answer, the legal answer is pretty clear, which is I, as the patient, get to control that information. And so if um, I test positive for a certain genetic condition, even though it might have implications for my children or my parents, you cannot share that with them without my permission. Um, unless you're treating them and you need that information for the treatment context. And so, you know, take that nuance for what it's worth. Um, so your privacy extends only to the extent, you know, that, that um, it's just informative versus necessary for the treatment of somebody else. So I want to push on you a little bit here, Pamela. Mm -hmm. I think we need to define the word treatment. In the old days, the practice of medicine was, was almost exclusively reactive, but we've been talking for a few decades now, and eventually we will hopefully get to the point of actually practicing proactive medicine and, and really engaging preventive health. So if I've got a patient who is at risk for a health condition because of something in the family history, I would construe that still as treatment. It's preventative treatment, but it's treatment. And therefore, that would give me, as the provider of my patient, the right to see that patient's mother's information because it's relevant to the preventive treatment that I'm trying to do. And I think that's right. I think so. Family medicine practices is where you get complicated because if you're treating everybody in the family, then you can share information and look at everybody's information in order to treat each other. I think the context where you might have let's let's take out of town relatives because that makes it a little bit easier. But if you're treating patient A and their parents, you know, live in or something of that nature, and you've uncovered a genetic issue that you really think the parents need to know about because they need to go get tested to see if they're carriers as well, that's a little harder because you're not treating the parents. So can you really argue that you'd be disclosing that information for the treatment of the parents? Not necessarily. Now, there is the other standard of you can make a disclosure to prevent a serious and imminent harm. So, you know, that's a different standard. And depending on what medical condition it might be, you, you might be able to share it. Um, if, it's a, if it's a very treatable condition and you think they're, but it's fatal or something of that nature, and you think you can meet that standard of I'm going to make the disclosure to you know, mitigate this serious and imminent, again, that's a pretty high standard, but serious and imminent harm, then you could potentially make the disclosure. But then you have to deal with the implications of having violated your patient's trust and privacy to make that disclosure. And so that presents its own own sets of complications, which is why I don't think we, I, we don't see it very frequently, but we could definitely work through potential, you know, warning strategies if, if clinician truly felt like this was a really imminent issue. Well, so these are, these are uh, issues of, you know, breaking confidentiality where, where, again, there's that harm to the third party and a duty to warn. Um, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, for the open notes uh, scenario, it's, uh, the patient has given that person access to the patient's medical record. And now that, that individual, that third party, family member, whoever it is, um, learns information, not, not that the clinician has disclosed it or broken confidentiality directly to them, but the patient representative has access to it and now has to you know, either question the patient, why didn't you tell me this? Or question the clinician, why didn't you warn me? Uh, or what do I do with this information? You know, I want to be proactive in my own health. Um, uh, what do I do? Um, so any, anybody have comments about that situation? It's the proxy getting access to the information. I'll add another genetic complication, which is that with today's knowledge, while the accuracy of genetic sequencing is very, very good, the call of an ACTG or deletion is highly accurate. We still live in a world where we don't know the clinical relevance of approximately half of all detected genetic variants. So another risk here is if I 
order a genetic test for my patient. And the result comes back a variant of uncertain significance, a clear deviation from the reference standard. There's no such thing as normal sequence. There's just a reference standard. Variants of uncertain significance are a deviation from the reference for which there is not enough data yet to clearly define it as normal or pathogenic. And I hopefully have a conversation with my patient to help my patient understand that a variant of uncertain significance is exactly that, it is uncertain. And trying to get past the natural subconscious bias to assume it's pathogenic or assume it's benign, those are both the wrong conclusions. But what if the proxy is a relative that lives on the other side of the country? I don't have the opportunity to talk to that proxy, but the proxy now sees that VUS, does not have the benefit of the genetic counseling to understand that it is neither normal nor abnormal, misinterprets it, and then takes some action, changing his or her own life irreversibly on the basis of a mistaken result, right? Maybe it's a variant of uncertain significance in one of the BRCA genes, and that proxy mistakenly believes that this is a pathogenic variant, gets him or herself tested, finds the same variant of uncertain significance, and has risk reduction surgery for something that actually was later determined to be a benign variant. Mark, the, the other issue that actually has come up in this context, and, and I don't know the medicine, so I apologize, I'm sure I'm going to butcher this, but it was in the immunogenetic context. And one of the concerns that the clinic had raised was the situation where oftentimes you can actually reveal a lack of paternity. Um, if you are testing um, a patient and you're trying to do a match, and that's your situation of potential proxy relationship where maybe a father has access to his or her th theoretical son. I mean, thinking that this is their son. They go through the genetic testing for condition and it is revealed through my chart that the genetic match doesn't exist. And that if there's a savvy father who understands the genetic coding will understand that the reason the match didn't occur was because the paternity didn't exist. And this was a legitimate concern that had been raised by a group, uh, the immunogenetic group, and we've been trying to work through sort of how to deal with it. One of the things that they've done to deal with it is to actually put in the consent form that this is a risk to going through this, this you know, uh, genetic testing, that you may actually inadvertently reveal lack of paternity um, in the course of the context. But I think it's a great example of what you're talking about, where if we're not careful, we may have pro proxies seeing information, revealing very sensitive information that may not be purely medical, but might be social more than medical and having a very um, poor response to it, given that maybe there were there was information within the family that may not have been previously disclosed. Yeah, so that's that's the next scenario is, is uh, not necessarily the test results, but uh, information uh, that the patient has shared with the clinician. Um, it could be, you know, uh, they know, you know, the woman knows that uh, the father is not the father, um, or the biologic father, um, or it may be that there's been an affair along the way, or, um, you know, a sexually transmitted infection, you know, various uh, forms of uh, sensitive information. Uh, and I'm thinking more of a scenario where the patient, when they had capacity, you know, made it clear, I don't want this shared with anybody. And so there's an expectation of, of confidentiality. Uh, but now that person loses their decision-making capacity. They have an advanced directive, as you said, a, a healthcare agent has been named. Um, now it's you know their spouse is their healthcare agent, and they get access to the medical record and find that sense or have the potential to find that sensitive information. Um, how would we? Uh, how do we either warn the patient that this is a possibility? Um, uh, when we're collecting information, how do we document the information in the medical record? Um, how do we warn the, the surrogate that you may see things that uh, uh, you weren't expecting? Um, any, any thoughts about any of those, how to handle it situations? Candidly, I think it's one of the hardest situations to manage. So I don't know if any of us have great solutions. I think we would like to see technology evolve to where we can get more granular in terms of what types of proxy is granted because your scenario is a great one, which is, you know, I give my husband proxy access or I give my, not proxy access, I give my husband my healthcare agency, assuming that what that means is that he will have access to information that's relevant for his role as my agent. Um, and I don't necessarily think about along the way, all the encounters I have with my physicians um, prior to my incapacity. And how do we 
um, segment out the information that is relevant for what decision making he may have to do in, you know, when I lose capacity versus what information is not relevant and should be kept confidential. Um, and while a clinician can make that determination as to what is relevant for that for his role as an agent, I'm not sure the technology can do the same. And so that presents a huge issue because giving him proxy access in that scenario to my my chart enables wonderful tools. It allows him to communicate with my providers. It allows him to see real-time test results again. But how do we deal with the historical information? I don't have a good answer, but it's, it's definitely a concern. I'd love to complicate this one even further as well and make sure that we include all of the panelists here. So let's think about children in addition. There's a, one, of, one of the sticky situations that we dealt with in preparing to adhere to, to the privacy, the information blocking rule, is what about the situation of a pregnant woman who, in fact, did have some toxin exposures, some, some teratog potentially teratogenic exposures during pregnancy, about which she did not tell the father of the baby and does not want to tell the father of the baby. So the first analogy here would be, okay, what if she's made the father of the baby her proxy, then it's incumbent upon us to protect the privacy of that information. But those exposures now make it into the baby's chart as well. And the father of a baby has a legal right to that information. And will correct me if I'm wrong, but, but what I've heard her say is absolutely has that right. So if that exposure, that prenatal exposure is documented in that child's chart, we've now potentially violated that woman's right to privacy. Yeah, and there's a lot of situations where this can happen. So I think in pediatrics, we do a lot of care of the whole family. So we're not just sometimes documenting issues that are coming up with the child in our notes, but we're addressing maternal mental health issues or other aspects of the mother's well-being or intimate partner violence between the mother and the father. So there's a lot of aspects of family health that go into a pediatric note that is not necessarily relevant just to the child. And so, yes, the historical history of prenatal substance exposure or, you know, even the mother being HIV positive and that not being something she wants disclosed to her, the father of the baby. And that case comes up not infrequently in practice and figuring out what do we do with that. It's hard enough to figure out what to do with it when like we can make choices about how we're sharing it or not sharing it. Now that, you know, with my chart and that they do have that proxy access, you know, how do we now have to be nuanced in figuring out what parts of the note do we share and what parts of the note do we have to copy and not share? And we'll talk a little bit more about this, I think, in the next scenario. But um, there's a lot of challenges and things that could be disclosed from that mother or other family members to the father of the baby. And that father of the baby and mother of the baby, a lot of my patients, like, they don't even have an ongoing relationship. I think to complicate things further, because this has been an issue that's popped up almost universally across the country with, with, with um, hospitals. The complicating factor is, you know, doesn't the dad have the right to know why his baby is on certain medications? You know, if you're, if you're giving the baby prophylaxis because the mother was HIV positive, where, does his, where do his rights come in as it relates to the baby versus her rights to maintain information confidentially? So I think that's where um, you know, you've got some real complicating issues that, that, again, the law may be somewhat clear. In that case, the father's rights to the, the, the baby's information sort of trumps what the mother's privacy rights are. But that does not make the situation any less complicated or difficult from a patient-physician relationship, from a family dynamics, potentially a, a violence or harm standard. I mean, there are a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration versus the clear cut, you know, yes, you have the right to the information. What does that mean? And what are the implications of that? So I actually would, would love to hear Mark's comment on, on a piece of this. For me, the HIV piece of it is easier because I think duty to warn comes back in. If the mother of the baby is HIV positive and the father doesn't know it, so I'm getting, I'm getting head shake. So, so there's no ethical responsibility to well, legal. Notify ethical. Right, legal. We, is there an ethical sorry, responsibility you... to notify a person that, that he or she is at risk of getting a, a, an incurable disease? I mean, as a society in, in public health, we've often mandated reporting of communicable diseases because others are at risk and, and it can be prevented 
if we know, and in some cases cured if we know before it causes severe disease. There's a presumption there that uh, the mother and father of the child are still sexually active. Um, well, they, they were sexually active at least once, we presume, least, yeah. unless it was in vitro <laughs> fertilization. Right. Um, but I, I guess we're mm -hmm. also thinking of the scenarios where the father is estranged from the mother, um, but still has access to the child's information. Um, so does he have a right to know about the HIV status of, uh, of the mother, um, where he has no actual risk to himself anymore? Um, and, and Becky, you may be able to say how you handled it in pediatrics uh, historically, um, and then just the added wrinkle of now the open, open note. I think it's very much like, as Pam said, it's complicated and it's not a one size fits all answer. The context really matters. So what is the ongoing relationship between the mother and the father? Will non-disclosure of it impact the well-being of the baby? So like if the dad is an active caregiver to the baby, because the baby is ultimately our direct responsibility. Um, like does the father need to know that information so that the medicine can be given? What's the mother's viral load? So is the mom really compliant with medication and has an undetectable viral load? So the actual theoretical risk to transmitting to um, the partner, even if they were still sex sexually active, may be very low. So there's a lot of factors that play into it. I think this has come up almost every year when we do ethics case teaching with our pediatric residents that one of the groups brings up a case like this and we have to work through it in a um, a structured way to really think about all the features of it because there isn't a clear ethical answer. I think I let Pam said legally, I think, um, I don't know if we are as the pediatrician, like I think there in Maryland, you don't automatically. So in, in Maryland, <laughs> if you are the tester, if you are the provider who tested for HIV and revealed the positive test results, then you do have the right to share it with sexual partners. But if you just learn of the HIV status at some point during the course, there's that same exception. I, I didn't write the law. I'm just saying that's what exists. So then you have to default to your serious and imminent risk to Howard's point. And what we've heard, at least from some, is to but Becky's point, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on the viral load. It depends on sort of what the relationship is, whether or not you feel like HIV transmission meets that serious and imminent risk is really a judgment call. And our clinicians now with so many viral therapies and, and HIV not necessarily being kind of what it was many years ago, some clinicians don't feel like it meets that serious and imminent risk that we used to, it used to. So I, I, that was why I was shaking my head, Howard. I didn't mean that it was a slam dunk answer. It's just only if you test and you're the one that uncovers the positive, are you the one who has the right on law to share with partners? It feels a little misguided because again, future happens. I mean, you know, but unfortunately that's what it is and to your point Howard we do report to the state and so I think the state might do their own sort of contact tracing in a lot of ways and so we look to them to sort of do some follow-up and figure out what to do kind of a, from a disclosure perspective going forward but it is complicated and there are lots of ethical issues there. And as an aside um, I, I've come to just to simulate thought I've, I've come to describing genetic conditions as our slow sexually transmitted diseases. It's just that they're transmitted vertically instead of horizontally. And, and I think it raises a fascinating ethical question about is there a duty to warn? Uh, certainly serious risk, not always imminent, but certainly serious risk with heritable genetic conditions, which by and large are transmitted due, due, through a sexual act. Well, let me, let me deal with uh, other sensitive <clears throat> information and, and have the child grow up uh, to become an adolescent. Uh, so now um, it's a teenager who is perhaps, you know, starting to explore the world and um, um, may not want everything shared with their parent about, you know, what they're doing in their life. Um, uh, Becky can perhaps uh, give us examples of, you know, kind of sensitive information that an adolescent might share and, and why there's, um, you know, a hope that uh, that information will be kept secret. Um, um, what's the rationale for protecting the confidentiality in that case? And then what do we do with a parent who has proxy access to their record um, and feels like they have a right to know what's going on with their child? So Becky, um, um, what do you think about those situations in adolescent medicine? Yeah, so I, I think uh, just for people to know, like a typical adolescent well visit when a patient comes in, um, you talk to the child or the teen with their parents 
or parents together and see what's going on. And then there's always a period of time where we quote, kick the parent out of the room and we give the teen an opportunity. And we usually start this around like age 12 um, to talk to us. And, you know, early on that may be because I think those conversations are important for um, developing autonomy, like which is a big part of our, I think duty as pediatricians is to promote the development of autonomy for our patients. And so starting to have those conversations where they feel like they are able to talk one-on-one -on -one with their medical provider and share things that they have questions about. It may not be things that we're thinking are quote, like sensitive, like reproductive health and mental health issues. It may be that they have a crush on somebody in their class and they share that with us because we've built over the years, like a relationship with them and they haven't been able to tell, sorry, my Amazon delivery is here outside. Um, they haven't been able to tell, um, or they don't wanna tell their parent that, but we're able to have those conversations or they're having changes to their body. Um, they've started noticing, you know, breast development or hair in new places and they're embarrassed to talk to their parent about that. So that may not be what I would consider like what we're gonna get to as the really sensitive um, high risk stuff that you wouldn't want to disclose, but it's opportunities early on to start having those conversations. And so then that child progresses and they may start be thinking, they're thinking about sex and they want to come in and they want to get on birth control. And I think it's incredibly important that teenagers have a space where they feel like they're able to trust their pediatrician to ask for birth control and to have those real conversations and be candid about what's happening who their sexual partners are, what their sexual identity is, what their gender identity is, so we can have those important conversations, which we know are important for their well-being, um, and doing it in that is in, in a space that they know is confidential. And so, when we kick the parent out, um, you know, I've been doing this in primary care now for nine years, and I can count on my hand the number of times a parent has said, "No, I'm not leaving the room." So, in general, it feels like parents are accepting of that it's important for us to have that space. And we try to be very transparent about what confidentiality is in that space and what things we are gonna keep between the two of us and then what the exceptions to that are. So, you know, we tell the teens up front, if you tell me information that says that somebody's hurting you, you're hurting yourself or you're gonna hurt somebody else, it may mean that we then have to share that information with your parents or other people. So I think it's important to have ground rules set at the beginning and then within that, we find that teens are very open and honest, and we can have really meaningful conversations if you have built this trusting relationship with them. What I worry about is that with these open notes now, there's just so many layers within the technology that an error can happen. And even if we, there is an opportunity to block a note because of privacy or harm, I think as those two exceptions would be the ones. So if the teenager says, I want you to not share this, we could block the note. But if the, let's say the 14 year old comes in for their well visit, there's gonna be a lot of important information in that note about the child preventive care or their chronic health issues, let's say their asthma or the management of even things like acne or their eczema that you want the parent to be able to read. So you don't wanna block an entire note, but you do wanna make sure that that protected parent kicked out of the room conversation is not being shared. And so we're now on this like logistical, <laughs> feels like a real challenge. We talk about it at every clinic meeting of how are we going to address this? Um, and we've started trying different strategies. You know, do you just create a separate note and you share one note, but you don't share the other note? I think that's a total setup for something slipping through the cracks. Like somebody's going to forget to unclick a note. Um, in our clinic, we're lucky to have a lot of other ancillary support staff. So social workers, mental health counselors who may meet with patients. Um, they also would each individually have to remember to unshare their note. Um, so there's just so many layers where I think that confidentiality, you know, erroneously could be broken. And then this trust between the teenager and the provider, which is so important to the well-being of that patient and the ability to really provide them the care they need, whether that be, you know, contraception, treating STIs mental health, substance use disorder. Um, I think it really puts it at jeopardy. And if some of these errors start happening and I as a provider don't feel like on my good conscience, I can tell them that this actually is gonna be kept private, then what is that gonna do to their desire to seek care and be um, open and honest with us? So I think it's really challenging. 
What about the strategy of just not documenting it? Um, are there downsides to not putting it in the record? So yes, especially <laughs> um, some of the challenges with that are, as you mentioned, I think when you showed the slide about what's the point of the medical record. So communication between providers, at least in our clinical setting, um, you may come in, you know, you see your primary care doctor, but you come in then for an acute care visit, or let's say the primary care doctor sent testing for sexually transmitted infections as a screening and it comes back that they have chlamydia. Well, now this patient, we need to get in as quick as possible into our acute care clinic to be treated for that. It's really important that then the new provider who's gonna see that patient is able to see the documentation and have a sense of what that history is, what maybe some of the risky sexual behaviors were that were disclosed by the teen and to be able to continue to have that conversation. Um, also historically coming in, so let's say Fast forward, you know, this teen had chlamydia, wasn't treated appropriately, comes in a couple of years later, has symptoms of, um, you know, an additional infection, or you're concerned that something's progressed and now it has a more significant manifestation of a sexually transmitted infection. Um, it's important to be able to historically look back and see, you know, what the patients had, what they've been treated for, whether or not they were ever treated. Um, so I think it has a lot of implications for their medical care and it's important, I think, to have it in documentation for provider sharing of information. Pamela, you were gonna react to that as well. Any yeah, one of the things we have been trying to really stress with even the implementation of open notes is do not stop documenting. Um, the document, the medical record is really the sort of the source of truth for your encounter with the patient. And there are lots of implications. I mean, Becky went through the most important ones, which is that's the record that, that you, you rely on to share with other providers. It's what the patient believes you discuss with them. I hate to be the lawyer in the room, but it also is what we need if we ever get sued and we have to defend ourselves in a malpractice. Um, so, you know, especially in the parent adolescent space, it's really important to document what, what we have with the, with the conversations we have with the, with the adolescent, um, in case there is an issue that we need to sort of share that this was something that we did discuss. And there could be a situation to Becky's point where we decide later down the line, you know what, that situation that I didn't think was going to be a big issue has now grown to a point where I think there might be abuse or there might be a neglect or there might be a harm thing. And I need to have that historical story so that I can potentially make an appropriate disclosure and, and, and take care of the child. It, it's really a temptation to just say, I'm just not going to document it because, it, or to really cut back on documentation to avoid this issue. Cause it really is hard. This is by far the hardest area of adolescents. Um, but I would strongly suggest not cutting back on documentation. So there's, there's a, another area here where I think ethics and the law are, are not perhaps always totally aligned. And, and Pamela, please, I, I, I may get this wrong. So I'm, I'm just teeing this up and throwing it back to you. As I've understood it, if we change the discussion from chlamydia to syphilis and think about late syphilis with cardiac manifestations, the teen who sees a cardiologist for complications of that syphilis, the way the teen got syphilis is legally protected, but the cardiac implications of the syphilis, that's not protected and the parent does have the right to know that, right? That's correct. And that's where, I mean, again, we have risk of harm and you could potentially block it if there's a situation of that, but from a purely legal privacy perspective, the, the, the getting tested for STI is what the minor has the right to consent to and protect. The implications downstream, they do not. So the parent would have the right to know that if there's a cardiac issue, the parent has to consent to any cardiac issues and they have the right to know what led to the cardiac issue so they can appropriately evaluate what the risks, benefits and alternatives are. And I think that that's a really cha big challenge and it's it, not new, but it, it, it's something that we struggle with a lot, I think. I think the other real challenge is, you know, we'll put something on a problem list. So it's not even just what you're typing in your note, but let's say you write onto the problem list then, Lydia, just to keep this example going. Um, and that then gets either seen somewhere within my chart or it gets just auto imported into the subspecial, like a totally unrelated subspecialist note where they just, it automatically fills in their whole active problem list. Um, and so may not even think to block then that note. And then all of a sudden you're seeing other stuff, even if you thought to not share it with the proxy on my chart in a different way. We've raised a lot of uh, conundrums <laughs> in the past hour. 
Um, we are at time, but I, I wanted to give an opportunity to any audience members, any questions for the panel, any uh, thoughts that we might have provoked, um, uh, comments that you wanted to share. Well, it's not seeing any. Um, I think it's been a fast hour. Um, I appreciate uh, all the panelists, uh, great comments. Um, uh, lots more to think about, but um, thank you all for joining today. Thank you.